Hey everybody, Dave here with an apology and an explanation. You know, one of the most fun parts of doing this show is our weekly Catch of the Day segment where Joe and I read examples of scam emails. And I usually use some sort of silly voice or character for the scammer. It is a lot of fun, and we've heard from lots of you that it's your favorite part of the show. Back in episode 165, I started our Catch of the Day segment, and what I was trying to emulate was Martin Short's character, Franck, from the Father of the Bride series of movies. I came up short, and parts of my interpretation came across as sounding like I was doing a stereotypically Asian voice. We've heard from a handful of you that found that offensive, and you're right. It is. I apologize for my poor job at doing a silly voice and that it came across as a harmful stereotype. I can say in good faith that was not my intention, and my hope is that we've built up enough goodwill here that you'll accept my apology and my explanation as sincere. I will strive to do better. I've gone back and replaced the audio from that segment. And as always, we thank you for listening and for your continued support. Now here's our show. You get up on stage and you get given a company name, a target. You're allowed to prepare and then you have to elicit about, it's about 20 to 30 pieces of information from this company over the phone, live in front of the audience in 20 minutes. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CyberWire's Hacking Humans podcast, where each week we look behind the social engineering scams, the phishing schemes, and criminal exploits that are making headlines and taking a heavy toll on organizations around the world. I'm Dave Bittner from the CyberWire, and joining me is Joe Kerrigan from the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute. Hello, Joe. Hi, Dave. we got some good stories to share this week. And later in the show, Carol Terrio returns. She's speaking with Chris Kirsch. He's the DEF CON 25 Social Engineering Capture the Flag winner. Have you ever been to security training? We have. What's it been like for you? If you're like us, ladies and gentlemen, it's the annual compliance drill, a few hours of PowerPoint in the staff break room. Refreshments in the form of sugary donuts and tepid coffee are sometimes provided, but a little bit of your soul seems to die every time the trainer says, Next slide. Well, okay, we exaggerate, but you know what we mean. Stay with us, and in a few minutes, we'll hear from our sponsors at Know Before, who have a different way of training. All right, Joe, uh, let's uh, go ahead and jump into some stories this week. All right. Uh, Mine comes uh, from cpomagazine.com, and it's titled, Nigerian threat actors skip social engineering, make direct pitches to employees to install ransomware on company networks. <laughs> and it's... <laughs> They're not wasting any time. Cut out the middleman, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> this is written by Scott uh, Aikida. Um, and really what they're pointing out here is is a bold plan from some scammers, and they think they are... Uh, coming from, well, let me ask you, Joe, guess a country that you think these these scammers are coming from. Well, Dave, you've already tipped your hand here. I'm going to guess Nigeria. Oh, that's right. It was in the title. Wasn't right. it? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, boy. <laughs> Nothing gets by you, Joe. Right. So, yes, you are correct. They are from Nigeria. Uh-huh. And uh, so, as we said, they're sort of cutting out the middleman here. They're going out on LinkedIn. And uh, they reach out to folks on LinkedIn, and they start with just a a nice little salutation to begin with, not tipping their hand. Uh But once they get someone on the hook, uh, basically they offer them a commission for installing ransomware on their corporate network. Really? Yeah. I mean, that's kind of brazen. (laughs) It is indeed. Uh, This story says that they're offering 40% of the proposed ransom amount— uh, the proposed ransom amount, I will add, is a million dollars. Right. If the employee is willing to install the demonware ransomware, either physically or remotely, uh, and then if you are if you follow up, they give you an, an Outlook email address or a Telegram username to reply to. Um, they say that the, uh, the attackers, they have typical broken English. Right. You know, not uh, passable English, but not great, which, of right. course, tips their hand. Uh, and shocker, Joe, shocker of shockers, 
uh, they don't really follow through with their promised payments. Oh, really? <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, you now, know, they, Dave, I'll tell you, I think that's a mistake on their part. Mm-hmm. Because if they if they actually paid the people, they might actually be successful. Yeah, yeah. Well, they said, I don't know. I mean, yes, you're absolutely right. But they said uh, in a follow-up, for example, that they would uh, pay out $120,000 uh, in response to a, f- a company turning over fifty million dollars, and this this is um, so some folks got in here, and uh, this is I should mention these are researchers from a company called Abnormal Security. Okay, they're the ones who uncovered all of this. Right. So they're researchers engaged with these uh, presumably Nigerian hackers. Right. And as they went down the path, uh, they were offered one hundred and twenty thousand dollars. Uh, to hack a company for fifty million dollars. Oh, if I is, no, there's uh, no way I'm going in for that small of a fee. <laughs> That's right. Everybody has their price, Joe. Right. <laughs> yeah, you're going for fifty million dollars. I want at least twenty of that fifty million. Yeah. If I'm going to be your guy on the inside. There you go. So, and you know what? Half in advance, please. <laughs> right. Yeah. See, turn it around on him. Right. Yeah. Just take the half and then then ditch him. Yep. <laughs> Uh, the attackers uh, say they also say that they're the developers of Demonware Ransomware. They're not. The right. code is publicly available on GitHub. Okay. So not surprisingly, uh, no honor among thieves here. Um, but I, I really think this is noteworthy uh, because of the brazenness, as we say here. They're, they're, they're not trying to, to fish people or get into their email accounts. They're just going directly to them and saying, hey, be our partner in crime here, and everybody's going to profit. Yeah. I wonder if you're an organization, I mean, this is a classic insider threat problem. Right. How do you deal with something like this? Uh, I guess it's it's protection, protecting your systems against the installation of ransomware, yeah, no matter where it comes malicious from. Malicious insider threat. Yeah. Uh, well, an endpoint protection system is going to be key here. You know, make sure you have tools that detect viruses or malicious software on your computer. Right. Uh, and then report that up to some central system to raise alerts. More importantly, I mean, this should be part of of every company's system is you should have auditing, right? Mm. So that if it come becomes apparent that one of your people is an insider threat, that you have the forensic artifacts to detail their activities and possibly prosecute them criminally. Yeah. So that's that's really, you know, I say I'm in for $10 million. I'm not in for this at all, right? I mean, because <laughs> right. <laughs> there is a, uh, there is a, uh, oh, I know my price was $20 million. I'm yeah. sorry. Okay. Let me, let me be lucidly clear on that. <laughs> um, okay. There is a lot of prison time waiting for somebody who does this, particularly here in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If, you, if they can prove it. Right. But hey, here we go again, right? It's greed. Right. Absolutely. Somebody, somebody's on their way out the door. They're not happy with where they're working and they're thinking, this is the compensation package I've been waiting for. Right. 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 Uh, and of course, it's not going to end up well for them. No, at it's all, not. If, if all. they get caught, they're they're doing a lot of time. Yeah. I guess another lesson here is just if you get these sort of unsolicited messages and on a place like LinkedIn, any of the social platforms, just don't don't bother replying don't, to yeah, them. Yeah. Don't just even engage them with them. You know. Let just them go. Leave them be. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Well, uh, again, we'll have a link to that story in the show notes. That's from uh, CPO Magazine. Joe, what do you have for us this week? Dave, I'm going on a trip soon. Mm. Well, don't worry, dear listeners. I will be back by the, by the time this episode is released, so don't try robbing my house. <laughs> well, they not. They would not make it past your vicious guard dog. Anyway. That's right. <laughs> guard dogs. <laughs> right, I have two right, of them. Right. <laughs> and they will give you the licking of a lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't tempt me, Joe. Don't tempt me. Right. <laughs> uh, Matt Karsten has a website called The Expert Vagabond. Hmm. And he has a story recently that he put up on travel scams. Now, uh, you know, my trip is going to be domestic, but these are all focused remotely, uh, you know, uh, for international travel. Okay. Things that happen in other countries don't really happen that much in the U.S., but I thought some of them are interesting. Yeah. These are some of his, uh, it, it, the article's pretty good. He actually goes into details about how he may have fallen for some of these at some point in time or tried to be targeted by them. Hmm. Uh, the first one is the broken taxi meter scam. Oh, right? okay. You get to the airport and you say, I need to go to the hotel. Right. Or if you're Steve Martin, you say, I would like to go to the hotel. <laughs> right. Um, and the cab driver says, all right, but my meter's broken. So you're just going to have to pay what I ask you to pay. Oh. All right. This is a scam. Okay. Right? You should either... Either at that point in time, start negotiating a price 
then, right? Or get out of the cab and find another cab or get a shuttle to the, uh, to the, to the hotel from, from the hotel. Ask the hotel if they have shuttle service okay. from the airport. What's the scam? The scam is that when you get there, they go, okay, that's a hundred bucks. Oh. Right. Uh-huh. And, and then if you don't pay, they, they threaten legal action because, you know, in, in most countries, uh, not paying a cab fare is a crime. Sure. Right. So they've kind of got you. Hmm. You don't, you know, so either, I, I would say either just get out of the cab. That would be my response. Oh, your meter's broken. Well, we can't, we can't ride with you then. Yeah. You just, just go on to the next cab. I guess also they're taking advantage of the fact that you're a stranger in a strange town. Oh, absolutely. So you're already feeling a little, perhaps a bit timid yep. because of that. Yep. You're, you're out of your element. Yep. Hmm. Interesting. All that applies. Yeah. What else? Uh, the closed or overbooked hotel. Uh, this is another thing that happens with cab drivers. You get in, you you say, take me to this hotel. And they go, oh, that hotel is closed for renovations. Hmm. And you say, oh, I have a reservation. Oh, uh, no, that, there's nobody going to that hotel. Hmm. Uh, and then they take you to another hotel that that provides them with a kickback and probably costs you more. Huh. So have you ever heard of that one? No, I have not. Uh, he, Matt says that he's never fallen for this one, but he's had two or three drivers try to pull it on him. Hmm. And Seems to me that one would be harder to get away with in, in the era of mobile devices where you could call the hotel and right. say, well, hey, are you open or not? <laughs> that, and that's, that's the advice. Uh, right. Call your hotel in advance. Make sure they're open. Right. And, uh, and when the cab driver says that they're closed, just say, you know what? Just take me to the hotel. Yeah. Or take a different cab. Or take a different cab. Yeah. Spills on your clothing. This is one we've kind of talked about before or similar to the two ones we've talked about before. And actually one of the things that I've said, this is absolutely how people could get me. Okay. Uh, it, we've talked about the scam of the, the mustard on the kid, right? Right. You have a kid with you and, and somebody uh, somehow smears mustard on the kid and then goes, the kid comes up to you and you're like, oh my God, my kid is, is, has this on him. Yeah. You're in a crowded place. You start cleaning the kid and while you're bending over cleaning the kid, someone picks your pocket. Oh. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, this is a very similar one. The person is walking, maybe they have a hot dog, right? Okay. Or maybe they have some coffee or something. I don't know. They but they bump into you and they mess up your clothing and then they start wiping your clothing down, right? Oh. So what they're doing is they're they're touching you and getting you accustomed to uh to being touched. We had uh Brandon, I can't remember Brandon's last name, but he was a magician yep. and a sleight of hand expert. He, yeah. he said that's one of the things he starts doing is he touches people, right. to get them accustomed to being touched. Mm-hmm. And then this guy reaches in and picks your pocket. Mm. Um, fake police scams. This one's terrifying to me. <laughs> Go on. Right? So first off, a person approaches you while you're in a foreign land and they say, hey man, you want to buy some drugs? Right? And you being like the stand-up citizen go, well, what kind of drugs? No, no, no. You say, <laughs> <laughs> you say, no, thank you. I'm not interested in buying drugs or doing any time in your prisons. Right. And just then, two more people come out of the crowd dressed as police officers and arrest the guy who tried to sell you drugs. And then they turn to you and go, hey, he was asking you, give me your passport and your identification, your wallet. Right. Oh. And they start like strong arming you. Yeah. Uh, Matt says that uh, you request that these people show their identification, and then you say, I don't have my passport. It's locked up back at the hotel. We can go back and get it. And if they refuse to comply with that, you can walk away. Hmm. Another solution I read for this is to say, you know what? Why don't we just go down to the police station, and I'll establish my identity there, Mm, right? mm -hmm. Usually that causes people to disappear, right? right? Because the police don't appreciate impersonators. Right, right. Um, that reminds me of the the uh, the advice that if you're driving, for example, and a police officer, you know, lights up their lights behind you and you right. feel as though it's not right, just doesn't feel right, you should just drive to the nearest police station. Right. And and deal with it there. You can also call 911 here in, in the States and mm-hmm. say, you know, I'm getting pulled over. You know, here, around here, there is a police officer that drives an unmarked car that I absolutely would not pull over for. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a Hyundai and it has LEDs in it. And I've seen this guy standing with other police officers, so I'm pretty sure he's a police officer. Yeah. But I'm not pulling over for that car. 
Right. I'm I'm calling 911 and I'm going, look, I think somebody impersonating a police officer is trying to pull me over. Can you please send a uniformed police officer to pull me over? Right, right. Um, <laughs> and say, yes, sir, Mr. Kerrigan. In fact, we'll send 12. Right, yeah. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. But I don't think there's a jury in the world that would convict me of, of evading a police officer when they see a picture of a Hyundai with LEDs in the front of it. Sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm not pulling over for that. That's a safety risk. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, the friendly ATM helper. Hmm. Right. You walk up to an ATM and of course there's no English written on it. Okay. Right. So somebody offers to help you. And uh, what they're there to do is actually, uh, they might even direct you to another ATM that actually has one of their skimmers on it. Oh. And then their uh, a skimmer is a device that will read the information off of the magnetic strip of your ATM mm-hmm. card. And they will then watch you as you enter your pin. And Matt says, don't let anybody be around you. Yeah, I think that's something that intimidates me about foreign travel is is dealing with the money. You know, the the conversion rates, the especially places that have very different uh, you know, values of their money, right? Where you know, 10,000 of something is is worth a, a dollar, or, you know, something right. like that. I I just I I I in other words, I I think I could be vulnerable in that situation because of my uh, lack of confidence in things like exchange rates and so right. on and so forth. Yeah, and you need cash to get around a lot of countries uh, yeah. because not everybody there. It's not like, not like in the U.S. where we have, you know, every merchant has Square, right, mm-hmm. or some other payment means that they can accept a credit card. Right. Uh, they're going to want cash for for their goods. Yeah. Uh, the group photo offer is another good one, right? If mm. you're with a group, somebody says, "Do you guys want me to take your picture?" And you're like, "Yeah." And then you're standing there and he keeps backing up and backing up and backing up and eventually just turns off and turns around and takes off with your camera. <laughs> and you're, you're like, oh. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> was- <laughs> I saw one um, where it was a team of scammers and they were targeting uh, tourists who had high-end cameras, you know, DSLRs. Right. And they would come in and they would distract them. And while they were distracting this person – they would steal the lens off of their DSLR. Really? Because some, you know, that some of lens these, is expensive. Some of these lenses are thousands of dollars. And right. So somebody has a nice lens, and and so the person still has the camera hanging around their neck. Yeah. But by the time these folks are gone, that you know, they look down and the lens is gone. Right. And that lens comes off with like a quarter turn, right? Yep. And yeah. So it's pretty easy to remove it. Yeah. I mean, if you know what you're doing. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, and I, these scammers know what they're doing. <laughs> they do indeed. You know, they probably run a camera shop. <laughs> right. Yeah, use lenses. To, right. <laughs> are us. <laughs> Here's a big one, and we've talked about this one before plenty of times, fake Wi-Fi hubs. Hmm. You know, op- open Wi-Fi. You should never use that while traveling. Yeah. Um, you know, except, except the fact that you're going to be in a foreign country and may not be able to communicate as readily. Uh, and if you can't afford to do that, maybe you don't go. I don't know. Um, yeah, I, you know, this is an interesting one because I've I've seen some folks, uh, you know, some knowledgeable security folks say recently that this may be overstated because, really? well, because we're we're at the point now where a high enough percentage of our information is encrypted by default with our web browsing that that really takes most of the risk out of something like this. Uh, yeah, and it, if they try to do a man-in-the-middle attack, nowadays it's pretty apparent. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that is that is true. Yeah. Um, I still, It's good advice, though. I mean, yeah, you, I, you, I still don't connect to these things. I use my phone. Yeah, yep, you know? yep, yep, yep. Good, good advice. Cheap enough. Yeah. This one's interesting, and when I did research for this episode today, I found a couple other variations of this one, but this is the motorbike rental damage scam. Hmm. Right. So you rent a motorbike for somebody. Yep. And uh, when you bring the motorbike back, there's been some damage that's been inflicted to it, usually like a slit seat. Oh. Right. And the guy at, at, the, at the rental place insists that you pay an exorbitant price for it. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, there is another one I saw that was uh, about um, uh, jet ski damage. Hmm. Right. You come back and there's some kind of damage. Maybe the damage was there before. Mm-hmm. But – in this instance, other people were in on the scam and they would get around the person who rented the jet ski and then essentially march him to an ATM to withdraw the money to pay for it. Wow. So it's a risky proposition, I guess. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't know what you do in this situation. I think you, uh, you know, get, get law enforcement involved as soon as you can. But, you know, who knows? In some, co- some countries, they may be in on it. Well, you know, uh, like when you rent a car, right? Uh, a lot of times there's, there'll be a little chart on the rental uh, 
you know, the rental form that has right. a picture of the car and they'll, they'll mark off if there's any dings on the car or anything like that. I could see like in a motorbike situation, you take some pictures before you head off with it. Right. With the person who's renting it, you know, <laughs> in the frame so that you can document that this was the condition of this thing when I left this place. Right. And then, you know, at the very least, taking that extra effort will probably have them leave you alone. Yes. They'll move on to an easier target. Right. Uh, in one of these scams, what they say is they actually have have somebody from the rental organization go out and slit the seat of the motorcycle. Oh, wow. Right? And then charge you an exorbitant fee for it. Oh. Uh, and what that means is they, they're just essentially selling motorcycle seats for a high price. Because those right. things pop right off and you put a new one on. Right. You know? Right. And they probably have an organization back there putting new— uh, The guy in the shop next door. Right. You know, motorcycle <laughs> seats are us. Exactly. He's in on the thing. Yep. That's fascinating. Huh. All right. One more? One more. Uh, gemstone or carpet deals. You meet up with a guy who uh, says, I have a very lucrative side business selling jewelry or gemstones. If you get these back to the United States, you could sell them for a huge profit. Yeah. Uh, of course, uh, all of these things are fake, right? Mm -hmm. He's selling you a bunch of cut glass. And uh, w when you're on vacation, no matter how good the deal is, remember, if it's too good to be true, it probably is. Yeah. You know, they're not going to sell a bunch of underpriced diamonds or, or rubies or whatever to, to just some guy they just met. Right. <laughs> they're, they're going to, uh, you know, they're going to make the, make more money on that selling it to somebody who's legitimate. So that's probably a scam. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, tourist destinations are not known for their great deals and right. shopping. And, yes. You know, <laughs> the, the jewelry store in the, uh, the resort hotel, probably not, <laughs> probably not the best deal. I but, love that piece. We are not buying that piece here. Yeah. <laughs> And, but that's not what they're about, you know. Right. So, uh, you know, I, I guess if, if you know what you're in for and you can afford it, well, then so be it. But uh, just word to the wise, right? Yep. All right. Lots of interesting stuff here. So we will have a link to that in the show notes, as always. Joe, it is time to move on to our catch of the day. Dave, our catch of the day comes from Reddit. Uh, the user has a name that's unpronounceable, so <laughs> right, okay. we'll just put a link in the show notes Fair enough. if it's still there. But uh, this user looks to have gotten some text messages from someone calling themselves Harnike Crush, and there is a picture of a very attractive blonde woman in, in as a profile picture. Yep. Yep. And uh, Dave, as always, why don't you play the the very attractive uh, blonde woman, and I will play the person that tried to, that, that this person was trying to scam. All right. <clears throat> Hey, how are you doing today? Good evening. How are you doing today? Hello. What's going on? Are you there? I'm good, thanks. Nice. How was your day? Why? Are you busy? My day was good. Yours? I'm cooking dinner right now, so yes, very busy. Oh, so when will you be free? How many minutes will that take? An hour. Okay. You told me just an hour now until today. You, you never text back. What up? Sorry, I got busy with other things and forgot. Okay, it's fine. So, good morning. How are you doing today? How was I'm, your night? I'm good today. How are you? I'm just good. Hope all is well with you. Did you sleep well? Yes. And where are you from? What state and city you in? So, I don't share that kind of information with anyone I just met on here. I hope you understand. Yes, but what bad? What bad knowing the state you are? Is it bad? Why, what are you trying to say? I'm saying that there are too many scammers on here to trust anyone initially. Okay, so not forcing you to be here. Why do you have the app and still use it? I'm just here to meet new people and make friends, that's all. So why are you saying scam? But certain private information will always stay private. If you make friends, won't they ask where you are from? There is not effing private I can't be your friend and know your darn place. It's stupid to me. Sure, but if they're genuinely interested in being friends, they'll understand that it takes time to build trust. Yes, it is, but not as you are shingles, saying, you want to be friends, I have to know many and I will ask. Why is it so important for you to know? Then block me if you don't want to tell because I will ask, I most surely know. You can ask. It doesn't bother me. Just know that I won't answer certain personal questions until I know you can be trusted. Okay, then F off. <laughs> nice to meet you too, scammer. 
Nice to meet you, effing dog scammers. F you, a hole whore. <laughs> Blocking you off my page. And that's where oh, it ends. That took a turn, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, it did. I mean, it took a really bitter <laughs> turn towards the end. <laughs> my goodness. It was pretty good. Yeah, you know, Joe, you get more uh, flies with honey. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this guy could have taken a little bit of time and built some rapport. And mm-hmm. then, uh, I mean, because it's obviously, I, first off, I love how you uh, do the voice of someone who's been smoking Marlboros for the past 20 years. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's like, it's like, this is like Lucille Ball in her later years, right? right? <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> because I'm pretty oh, sure this Daisy. is not a, uh, an attractive blonde woman on the other end of this conversation. <laughs> no, probably, good. Yes, I, I, would, I would bet on, on that. Yeah. <laughs> probably a safe bet. Yeah. All right. Well, that is our catch of the day. Uh, we would love to hear from you. If you have something you'd like us to share, you can email us. It's hackinghumans at thecyberwire.com. And now back to that question we asked earlier about training. Our sponsors at Know Before want to spring you from that break room with new school security awareness training. They've got the world's largest security awareness training library, and its content is always fresh. Know Before delivers interactive, engaging training on demand. It's done through the browser and supplemented with frequent simulated social engineering attacks by email, phone, and text. Pick your categories to suit your business. Operate internationally. Know Before delivers convincing, real-world proven templates in 24 languages. And wherever you are, be sure to stay on top of the latest news and information to protect your organization with Know Before's weekly Cyber Heist News. We read it, and we think you'll find it valuable, too. Sign up for Cyber Heist News at knowbefore.com slash news. That's K-N-O-W-B-E, the number four, dot com slash news. All right, Joe, Carol Terrio is back. She always brightens things up around here, doesn't she? Hello, Carol. Yes, she does. <laughs> so, Often when I'm typing, I hear things in Carol's voice. Is that right? Yes. All right. Well, maybe you should talk to your doctor about that. Maybe I should. Um, she is uh, bringing us her interview with Chris Kirsch, and he was the winner of the DEF CON 25 Social Engineering Capture the Flag. Here's Carol Terrio. Today, I would like to welcome Chris Kirsch to Hacking Humans. Chris has been in the cyber world for over 20 years. He's worked all over the world and is an expert on encryption, hacking, and he's the co-founder of Rumble.Run. Now, Chris is also a winner of DEF CON's SC... S-E-C-T-F. E-C-T-F. Think social engineering capture the flag. Yeah. Um, which I know nothing about that. So Chris, thanks so much for joining me today. Let's first talk about DEF CON and getting this black badge. Tell me about that. Sure, I'd love to. So uh, DEF CON is one of the world's biggest hacking conferences. I think it's actually the biggest one, about 30,000 people that uh, you know fly into Vegas every year. Not right now. <laughs> but it's so huge, actually. It's amazing to think it, it is huge. They they take up three entire big conference hotels in Vegas now. They started out a lot smaller, but it's just grown over the years. And uh, DEF CON has all of these different, what they call villages, different parts of the conference that specialize in different things. And one of those is the social engineering village, where they give talks on the topic of social engineering. But they also have this really cool competition that I participated in. I saw it in my first year, and it just blew me away, and I just wanted to uh, to engage in that. So the competition is basically you get up on stage in front of about a thousand people, okay, and you get given a company name, a target. You are allowed to prepare, and then you have to elicit about it's about twenty to thirty pieces of information from this company over the phone, live in front of the audience in twenty minutes. Wow. It's it's a lot of fun. It's nerve wracking. I bet. Uh, first year, I did really well in the written part, but I uh, when I got up on stage, nobody picked up their phone because it was a Saturday afternoon. So I really bombed the first year, and I thought, you know, I've already lost my dignity here. Not your fault, though. <laughs> Not your fault. Not your fault. Yeah, I already lost my dignity. So what can go wrong? I'll go back next year. And so the following year uh, went really well, and I won the competition, and that earned me what's called a black badge at DEF CON. So that means 
means it's, you know, like inflates my ego and then also get in for free. That's pretty much what it means. So you can go in any year, any time. You can just swan yes. in. You're like V V V V I P. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> nice. And I, and I like I'm glad freebies, we're friends, right? <laughs> buddy. <laughs> and when did this happen? When did you win this black badge? God, this was DEF CON 25. So the silver anniversary. And this was, I think, about three years ago. Something like that. Yeah. You're the perfect person to talk to because you basically play a bad guy, right? You're playing a scammer mm -hmm. effectively. So where are we as people vulnerable? Like what works? How do you know, how do you go through the mindset of winning trust from these from these victims? Sure. So it actually starts out way before you pick up the phone. Because uh, what I did is after I got the name of the target company, and this was a that year the the topic was a toy and gaming companies. So I had the name of a target and I had three weeks to research that target. So right. I went really deep on LinkedIn, on Glassdoor, on all sorts of sites to read everything I could find about this company and to understand the jargon uh, that they're using internally because every company's got their own language, uh, to understand how they are organized, to find phone numbers of the different departments and what they care about, understand the company mission, understand what are hot topics for that company. Mm -hmm. And now, once you have a phone number, you can say, all right, if I target this particular person or department, uh, then I have enough background to build a really credible story, something that we call a pretext. And so this, this OSINT, this open source intelligence, the research that I did up front is really helpful to build trust very quickly. So for example, when I called up, I, I, I called up a retail uh, location that they had because that was something that was open uh, during my call time. And I just said, hey, I'm Mike so-and-so from Wilmington because I knew that that was where their headquarters was for oh, the smart. subsidiary of the company, right? right? So I don't even have to say I'm from this subsidiary, et cetera, et cetera. You just use, and that's what I mean by internal lingo. So I'm from Wilmington and uh, I work on the ERP team. Yep. Uh, I have a quick question for you. Are you open right now? Do you have customers in the store? Because that is a question that they would answer even to like the average Joe customer who is calling in, right? Are you open right now? So. I wanted to start out with something very simple that they would be comfortable asking. And mm -hmm. then I say like, hey, I'm asking because I haven't gotten any bookings data from your POS systems, from your point of sale systems. Mm -hmm. Using lingo again to try exactly and yeah. using mm -hmm. lingo again. And I think the person I had was like an assistant manager or maybe security guard, something like that, not at all trained on avoiding scammers on the phone. If you call a call center, a support center, something like that, they're usually trained. But these folks are in retail. They're possibly even minimum wage, right? They're not well trained on this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's why I targeted the store. And so uh, I asked them, hey, can you check, does your store have internet access right now? Can you check Facebook, right? So again, I'm increasing my ask, mm -hmm. but it's not a crazy ask. It's not a crazy jump. And so I increased it more and more and more until I uh, got them to agree to basically receive a router that I'm going to send them as a replacement uh, through FedEx, and they're going to plug it into the network and send me the old one, right? So if I can control what they plug into the network, I, you know, I, I win, right? Because I have presence on the network. Yeah. I also got them to go to a website of my choice uh, by saying, hey, can you help me? Just go to this website. It's a quick diagnostics tool to help us figure out what's wrong, right? Little asks for help often uh, are often responded to if, if you build rapport up front. And uh, one technique I used right in the beginning when I called them was actually something that I call an artificial time constraint. So that means I told them that I only have a certain amount of time so that they don't feel that they have to get me off the phone, right? So what I told them is, hey, I wonder if you can help me with this. I only have five minutes because I have to pick up my kids. That's so sneaky. Right? Yes. <laughs> and that actually also works really well in sales. Like if any uh, folks listening are in sales, if you're doing cold calls and you're saying, hey, um, I'm sorry, I have a customer meeting in five minutes, but I just wanted to make sure I follow up with you on your white paper download um, to answer any questions that you may have. Right? Now, 
the person on the other end doesn't think, oh my God, a sales guy, how do I get rid of him? Yeah. And for the rest of us, when someone gives us an artificial time constraint, we know what's going on. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but now they're thinking like, oh, okay, this guy's got to go. I don't have to worry about him keeping me here for ages. Right. So uh, I use that. So those are some of the, the small techniques. Amazing. And all this info listeners can help us stay out of their way. This was Chris Kirsch. He's the co-founder of Rumble.run and a recent Black Badge winner at DEF CON. Chris, thanks for coming on the show. All right. Thank you very much for having me. All right, Joe, what do you think? Uh, that's a great story. Very interesting to hear how that goes. Yeah. Uh, the Social Engineering Capture the Flag, or SECTF as it's called, is a DEF CON competition that's run by uh, Christopher Hadnagy right now. Mm -hmm. We've had on this show, and he's uh, the author of social engineering books that are really like the gold standard. Yeah. Uh, this competition is also the competition that uh, Rachel Tobeck has won multiple times. Yep. Uh, now Chris Kirsch is on the show. So we've had multiple DEF CON winners, of, multiple winners of this, multiple <laughs> black badge holders. So I'm, right, I'm right. pretty happy about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, whenever you win uh, a DEF CON event, you get a black badge. Mm. Uh, that entitles you to go into all the remaining DEF CONs. Every, every subsequent DEF CON, you just walk in with this badge. It's oh, nice. Well, that's swanky. It is. Uh, there are two parts to this Capture the Flag event. The first part is an open source intelligence gathering, or OSINT part. Yep. And the second part is a vishing part. And in the OSINT part, you have to actually build a report and hand in a report on a company. Hmm. And Competitors have three weeks to complete this report. So it, it actually starts, this, this event starts before the DEF CON event starts. Yeah. And then when you get to the DEF CON event, you actually make the phone calls and try to get the information that you're, you've been tasked with getting. Right. Uh, Chris talks about going to LinkedIn and Glassdoor to do his OSINT, target the company. Yep. But you can also look at Google, Facebook, Twitter, any open source resource that's available mm -hmm. is going to have information about these things. You know, a lot of times companies have presences on these social media platforms where they can, um, you can gather information about what they do and how they do it. And he determines the internal jargon of these companies, which mm. I think is interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to know how he does that. He in gets their organization. So a lot of times you can find org charts online. Yep. And then he finds their hot button issues. And once he has this information, he builds a pretext, which is the lie that uh, he wants people to believe. And building that pretext text is easier because of the of the amount of open source intelligence gathering he's done. Right. You know, when it's very important for people to realize that when they are targeted by a social engineering attack, th there has been all kinds of research that's gone into it beforehand. And not just a social engineering attack, just about any kind of cyber attack is going to start with open source intelligence gathering. And these attackers are going to, to do exactly that. They're going to gather all the information about your site. If they're going to do a, um, about your company rather, they're going, if, if they're going to do an actual like cyber attack, they're going to have a map of all your resources that are on the internet. They're mm -hmm. going to know what's going on. Right. It's interesting. He, he talks about in this one case, how we targeted somebody at a, uh, at a retail location because he knew that person was probably not going to be trained as well as the people at the corporate locations, hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then he's going to get, uh, essentially got them to agree to hook up a router on, <laughs> on their network. And essentially that would hook it right up to the corporate network. Yeah. So very interesting. Uh, one of the other key events or key pieces of inf information here is that he uses the artificial time constraint. Mm. Right. He's like, look, I got to go in five minutes, but I need your help right away. Mm -hmm. um, and the guy's like, okay, well, I can help you for five minutes. Yeah. That's, that's how this works. That's, mm -hmm. that's how this mental trick works. Also, he comes in saying that he's from the corporate office, but he uses the proper lingo, the proper jargon for, for getting that to get him to drop their, uh, I think it was Wilmington. He says, I'm, I, I'm from Wilmington. Yeah. So, yeah. Like the, the headquarters. Cause right. that's what they call the headquarters. Right. Right. Right, and so he short circuits uh, right. some of the suspicion that they might have. Immediately gets the guard lowered. Yep, yep. yep. All right, well, uh, interesting interview for sure. We appreciate Chris taking the time for us. And of yeah, course, thanks to, thanks to Carol Terrio for joining us as well. 
And we want to thank our sponsors, Know Before. They are the social engineering experts and the pioneers of new school security awareness training. Be sure to take advantage of their free phishing test, which you can find at knowbefore.com slash fish test. Think of Know Before for your security training. That is our show. We want to thank all of you for listening. And of course, we want to thank the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute for their participation. You can learn more at isi.jhu.edu. The Hacking Humans podcast is proudly produced in Maryland at the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our senior producer is Jennifer Ivan. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie. I'm Dave Bittner. And I'm Joe Kerrigan. Thanks for listening. <laughs> 